Welcome to Experience Life Today. I'm Reuben E. Goff. It's good to be with you here on this Sunday morning. Glad that you've tuned in. We've got a message on tap for you. It's actually part two, availability part two, where we're dealing with over there in Isaiah chapter six, if you remember from last week. And now we're just going to expound on more with it. More revelation was coming with that particular message and dealing with here am I, send me, and how a lot of times that we, we say those words, and I speak for myself also, that, you know, here am I, Lord, send me, and then all of a sudden we realize that God a lot of times will send us, but it means inconvenience. And then we start looking for alternatives and thinking, well, maybe God didn't really say that or whatever the case might be. But many times in the calling of God, in the callings of God, in the exercise of His dispensing us out into whatever that plan might be for our lives, a lot of times does take in inconvenience and it takes into some sacrifice and things of that. So when we really say, Lord, here am I, send me, do we really know what we're saying? And actually the impact of that statement is very powerful and can be very uh, dramatic in the life. And I'm not going to say traumatic, it's not that, but it's very dramatic in the life and what God will expect out of us. But know this, it's all for God's glory and all for His kingdom. I want to bring you up to speed also uh, on YouTube. Uh, there has been a change on the YouTube channel. The YouTube videos are now clearer and more crisp. Uh, we have updated some of our internet connection. It's faster. And now when you watch the present videos on YouTube, they are clear and crisp and good quality. I apologize for all of the time we didn't have that quality. Uh, it was a little bit bleary at times. It wasn't always the best. The audio was fine, but the picture quality wasn't. But now, both are well, audio and the video quality. If you have DirecTV, you have access to our channel. And on DirecTV, you can actually go through your programs and actually get to the uh, I forget what it's called there now, but you go over to YouTube and punch in my name if you want to. Just punch in Reuben Eagle, and all of those videos will come up and you can watch and, and select what you want to watch. And if, of course, if you go online, go on to YouTube and you can find us. You can go to our website and also shoot off of it also. And so either way is fine and you can watch those videos and keep up to date. Also to keep this on to you, uh, Avoiding Relationship Mayhem, you can order this directly from us. It is $5 a piece or you can go on Amazon.com and punch it in. You can punch in my name there. All three books will come up. You can order all three or they actually have some sales on those books uh, on my other two as well. But Avoiding Relationship Mayhem is available for $5, okay? So if you send us in a love gift, we'll get it right back out to you in dealing with uh, relationships and the importance of maintaining healthy relationships, etc. Very excited about this book. It's a very small book, concise, gets the right to the point. A lot of nuggets being dropped out through it. I also have another book that's coming probably within the next four weeks. Uh, another book is going to be coming out and being published simply entitled, you're going to love this, Please Grow Up! Exclamation point. And of course it's a book about maturity. It's a larger than this book. Uh, probably a little bit larger than the last two that I've written. I think you're really going to enjoy that one too. And as a matter of fact, if you know somebody needs to grow up, buy the book. You don't have to say a word. Just hand it to them. I'll take the brunt of it, okay? <laughs> and just say, look, I just have a word for you. And right on the front it's going to say in big letters, please, I just designed it this week, please grow up. <laughs> and so you can keep an eye. We'll keep you up to date on that one, that book. But in the meantime, this one's out. And you get this for a nice low price. I think for five bucks, you can't beat it. The office line. We're trying to hurry up here and get down. We don't have two more minutes to go. We'll get right into the message availability part two. 240-707-1501 uh, is the new office line. And uh, some of you are already taking advantage of that. You can call if you have any questions, uh, anything uh, regarding Experience Life today. Uh, also, your prayer requests, uh, some are using it to put it on the, uh, the machine or talking uh, about the prayer requests. We'll come into alignment with you and speak with you, whatever the case. Needing prayer, uh, call that number again. I'll give it to you. And I haven't memorized it myself yet. I need to get it memorized, but it's 240 707-1501. And so if you dial that number, you have access to the office at any time, day or night. Now I'm not going to promise you somebody's going to answer it. 
but the machine is there, and we will get back to you. And uh, when time permits, we will get back with you. We will pray with you uh, in any other questions you might have, okay? All right, getting down to business. Here we are. You're less than 60 seconds away from availability part two. And I believe God started last week uh, really ministering to our hearts. This week, it's going to go even deeper into this. I thought we were done with it. And I don't say that despairingly. I just thought it was over in one message. And boy, God just brought more back through the week and availability and what it means. And I tell you, God has purposes and plans for all of us to pursue. And again, yes, it means inconvenience. Sometimes it means sacrifice. Sometimes it might even mean relocation. Uh, you never know. God, though, has the end from the beginning. He understands it. He knows what he's called you to do. And so all you have to do is bring yourself into alignment. And when you say, Lord, here am I, send me, fasten your seat belt, put your steel toes on, where this ride ends, nobody knows except the Lord. But one thing for sure, you can enjoy the journey and it will be exciting. And I speak for that as well. And I know you will also. Here we go. Fasten your seat belts. We're going to experience life today. And it's, it doesn't sound pretty when we're getting into this. But I want to tell you something. We uncorked a bottle on Sunday night. And Sunday night was, how many remembers the message on availability? It's the title of it, but we took it out of Isaiah chapter 6. Here am I, send me. How many knows what I'm talking about? And I warned you and warning myself uh, with a little bit of trepidation that uh, I know, I know it, you know it, that it is a dangerous thing to say God to God and really mean it. Now, if somebody says it don't mean it, doesn't really do much at all. But if you look at God and you say to him in prayer, and I mean it's coming from the heart, and you say, Lord, when he's looking for people to sin, and, and I, don't, I, I know you know this, but he's looking to send every one of us in this house and everyone who will, who meets the qualifications of salvation, uh, he is looking across the entire planet tonight and he will use anybody as long as they are available to be used, make themselves available. Do you agree with what I'm talking about? And so uh, God, it, so it's not simply just picking and choosing and there is particular graces upon particular people and giftings, we understand that. However, it doesn't matter what the gifting is, God has a purpose and a plan for every single person's life and it isn't to come and sit and that's the end of the sentence. That is the beginning of the paragraph of the life and that's literally when we come in here and when we pray pray, uh, the transcript of our prayers basically in worship in this house ought to turn in to be what is being written as the script for our life once we leave here. So when we come in here, it is to give God praise. It is to give God worship. And now at this point in the service a lot of times, now we are ready. We are to receive what? Instruction, not from Reuben, but instruction from the Word of God and the Holy Spirit that will tell us uh, not just something about ourselves, but look, what is my instruction when I leave this building? God, what would you have me to do and take it outside the four walls? Amen? And so... I want to build on this when we get into this, and I want to tell you something, and let me tell you how dangerous it is. For two days, God has dealt with my heart and about here am I, send me. And in prayer today, when he was talking and speaking into my heart and into my spirit, I, I, I want to tell you, you know, sometimes people say, maybe they're watching, they say, oh, God talking to you and this and that. No, Jesus said, my sheep, what? Hear my voice. That means he's got, a, he's got a voice, and that means he talks. you got to be able to hear the voice of the Lord. Amen? And so, uh, and I want to tell you, a preacher needs to hear the voice of God. <laughs> Thank you for that. Amen. You see, uh, what, when, I, when I started to look at this, and I pondered on this and meditated, I said, Lord, we as a church, here am I, send me, ultimately send us, 
And now what does all of that mean? And I'm going to ask you tonight, when you said that on Sunday night, what did that mean to you and what kind of an idea did you get when you thought about it? This is not a negative, I'm not, I'm not laying it, I'm trying to get us in myself as well. When I said, Lord, here am I, send me, what was in my mind? And you're going to see something here. We have to be real careful of gaining preconceived ideas instead of remaining totally clear and open to the will of of God. And you're going to see the power of this in just a moment. Now, uh, we was talking here last week, and, I, and, and Sister Darlene, I loved that, what she wrote. And, and when I said, you know, God had just said in my spirit that sometimes in life, you just have to turn the page. You remember that from Sunday, from the week ago? And, and, and Dar Sister Darlene said, and sometimes you turn the page, uh, it's not just another page of the same chapter. You turn the page, and the next page is a new chapter. And I thought about that. You know, a new chapter is not just a, another page page in the book. A new chapter signifies it's a new topic. It may be a new look in the book and there's a new uh, paragraph and there's a new thread of thought and there and ultimately a chapter is there as a break because now there's come a change uh, from the previous chapter and so I believe God is trying to take us and move us into another chapter and that requires you're going to have to change a little bit and I'm not talking about being come, or going from being sick sinful to holy, we should already be holy. We're talking about the progressive sanctification or maturing in Christ. And sometimes to grow, you got to expand a little bit and develop a little more. Amen. And sometimes when you develop a little more, uh, one thing you don't want to tell God. And most of the time we never say it here, but we do say it here. Well, Lord, this is the way I've always done it. God will break the mold in our minds. Come on now. And now, now, not just now. Listen, when we turn the page and we're growing, I'm just going to read to you some things God dropped. You, you know, it's not, Christianity is not just about what we abstain from. It is also, but what are we doing I know we use it as a brag. I don't smoke, chew, cuss. I don't uh, fornication, don't commit adultery. I don't, I don't lie. I don't murder. I don't do these things. However, well, that's wonderful, and that should be a part of the life. That should be a testimony. But there's another side of the coin. But now what are we doing for Jesus Christ? Okay? Now, uh, this is where this, <laughs> I'm going to give this an example. I'm going to change the name and everything. But you know, uh, the Lord really brought this into my heart and mind and understanding something. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And as you're turning to Romans chapter 12, and we're going to be right there in uh, the first two verses. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> and as I was pondering this, and I thought about an incident that took place. <clears throat> I'm going I'm to call the person Johnny, okay? I, this really happened. And I'm sitting, and I'm talking with Johnny. And Johnny is telling me about a message uh, that he, was, he had listened to. Not in this church, but this is a real happen. This really happened. And Johnny said, I, Pastor Reuben, I listened to that message. And, and, and Reuben, I really enjoyed that message. I, I, I'm telling you, I, I really uh, uh, liked that message. And I was agreeing with you uh, throughout that message and begin to pull out points. And, you know, I, that's how I believe. I, I really believe that. And said, it really got me excited. And, but then we, we kind of talked about the message. And finally, Johnny looked at me and said, but Reuben, you know what? But, but what, what can I do and what can we do? I mean, what, in, in, in a moment of frustration and looked at me and very sincere and said, well, what can we do? What, what can I do? And, and immediately at that moment, I looked at the person because I knew in the message I had given a bullet list of about three to four things specifying what a Christian can do and contribute that's in the message. And all of a sudden, the person, Johnny, looks at me and, and with a funny look on their face and finally kind of grinned and it was like a light bulb went off and said, oh, 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 oh wait a minute. Uh, Pastor Reuben, you, you did tell us what we could do in the message. 
And this really hit me in understanding that many times when we're listening to a message and we can leave and say, you know what, that was good, I liked that, I enjoyed that, I felt the anointing in that. But, but you know, a message, that's not where it's to end. As a matter of fact, what can I take from the message and do it when I leave the house? Many times we forget what God is telling us because we just, well, I felt good. What a message. Who you raw, who raw, whatever. And we get our pom poms out of it. Hey, it's it's applause and we're excited. We do the dance. But when we leave here, God spoke to us so that when we leave, put it into action. And this is where the disengaging takes place in the American Christian culture. They they believe that preaching and teaching a lot of times is simply for a temporal moment of enjoyment and goose bumpy feely or a shout. They don't realize it is a moment of instruction. I just received my commands downloaded from heaven. I am now commissioned. Go do what thus saith the Lord says. And how many times we forget what God is saying and what he's doing. Now, uh, (laughs) I'm going to take this even further here in just a moment. But matter of fact, I'll just do it right now. I saw Dr. Chan. He, uh, C-H-A-N-D, he's a a, 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 a leadership guy. I like him. I I followed him around for years, like, you know, just watching his videos and things. Always enjoyed it. I'm not not copycatting everything he said because he's dealing with another subject. But when I pondered on this, I couldn't get it out of my mind, the illustration, because I thought about with this message, God began to tailor make the illustration for our church. And, and now, if, if this plate here, now you can see it's good and clean, right? All right. Now, get in your mind. We're going to make you hungry now, so you didn't eat. It's going to make you hungry. Now, I want you, do you like steak? Juice, what do you like? Salmon. You like steak. All right. No, I didn't ask you. I'm just kidding, Madison. All right, chicken then. All right, chicken. Ch- oh, yes, we love chicken. And, and, and we get to heaven, there's going to be chicken. Uh, but, you know, chicken, uh, take a, 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 a beautiful piece of, how about, how about rotisserie? We put it on there, it's just dripping with, oh, yeah, more grease. I don't care what the dietitians say. I like grease. And put, put that down on there and sit it on there. And I'm telling you, and I'd hand that to you, and of course you'd, oh, yeah, well, we need it. Now, I'm going to change the scenario just a little bit. Let's say this plate has some uh, from two days ago. Uh, maybe we ran it through the washer, but do you know how it misses? And you might have a streak of cheese about right here. It's hard, crusty. And maybe a little egg yolk, it's still crusty about in here. And over here, you got uh, something else. And there's, there's kind of leftovers that's, uh, you know, kind of plastered on the plate. And now, now, all did now. No, we're not changing the chicken. Chicken's still the same, juicy. Oh, it's great. Perfectly done, just the way Bonnie loves it. And we take it <laughs> and we set it down on that plate, that same plate now, and, and that's got all these other things a part of it. Now, if I'd hand that to Bonnie, probably would she eat it? <laughs> Depending on how hungry you are. Uh, but, but you realize, but most of the time, uh, no, most of us would look out and say, I ain't eating that. If you got that in a restaurant, you'd look at the plate and you'd say, I'm not eating that chicken. And now notice, there's nothing wrong with the chicken. It's simply the plate that it's sitting on, okay? Now, I swear I'm borrowing a little bit from Dr. Chan, but I, 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 I like this part. The Lord began to deal with my heart about that as well, and I just wrote some different things down for us. Now, it changed that. Now, you can place that on there, but there's remnants of cheese and yolk and, and potatoes and all of that and not been clean. Uh, you won't eat the steak. Now, there's nothing wrong with the steak, but it, the plate and the environment destroys the effect of the, the chicken or the steak or whatever you want on there, your favorite meat. Now, and see, and you can keep every day, every day, I can take that fresh chicken off of there, put a new one on, take it back off, and you'll never eat that chicken because of the environment that it's sitting in. Now, you say, what's that got to do with us? Let me tell you something, and we're going to read these verses. Our minds, our minds create a culture and environment inside of our lives. 
And too many times, if our lives are cluttered with things such as this is the way I've always done it and I'm not going to change, and I have preconceived ideas of what God will do and what he won't do and this and that, and I don't have it biblically based, but it's just my own little thoughts and ideas. Do you know what will happen? The word of God, like that chicken or that steak, you can come to church and it can be laid right on your vessel and you never receive the effects of the word because there's too much old remnants of litter and stuff around in your life and it's corrupting by its own environment. It's corrupting the ability of the steak and the chicken to have an effect on the life of the individual. And God began to deal with my heart because I said to the Lord in the past some weeks, Lord, as much information and revelation as we receive, there ought to be more happening even in our own lives and as a corporate culture here in the church. And God began to deal with my heart. And he said, this is the fact. You can lay that pristine meat in their every service and it won't do any good until the vessel gets cleaned out of its own messed up thinking and get the mind renewed so it can accept that great food of God. Come on now. And, and uh, you see, now, oh my, you say, well, I don't know about it. Now listen, look at Romans 12. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now read with me verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. Now what's going to happen? But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, Whew. that you may what? Prove or test what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Oh, that's good. I'm telling you, that's good. What, what do you mean the mind? Why does the mind have to be renewed? Because the mind controls the, the, the thought processes and the strongholds of the life. It is what creates the inner environment of the life. Listen, too many times we deal with symptoms when we can just go to the heart of the problem and change it. A lot of times we'll take pills dealing with the symptoms. Not against Dolly, but a lot of times something is producing that. And so what do you do? You go to the doctor and now they're going to get down to the root of the problem. And we can stay outside of his office and say, well, you know what? I'll just take this. It'll just dull the pain. Why not get rid of the problem and then you'll have to deal with the pain that it causes. <laughs> Come on now. You know, well, I don't know about it. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. Oh, Isaiah said 26. He said, he, him will he keep in what? Perfect peace. Who's what? Uh, in, in perfect peace. Whose mind, uh, mind is what? Stayed on thee. There's more of that verse. It gets even better yet. But that's enough for us right now. But his mind, my mind, if it stayed on Christ, what am I doing? I'm thinking in alignment with God. When I think in alignment with God, that means I'm thinking like God thinks. So if I'm thinking like God thinks, that means I get the same environment inside of my heart that is over in heaven. It'll be full of peace. But you all know there's nobody warring over in heaven. There's no Middle East in heaven. Do you know that? There's no Crimea in, 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 in heaven. There's no, you know, there's nothing, nothing like that in heaven going on war. It is a peaceful, tranquil place. One guy tried to upset it up there and he got thrown out. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Amen. Uh, you know, even in church, I'm going to just bold and say it. I tell you, people cause problems, maybe the same thing ought to happen to them. Boy, it got quiet. <laughs> Well, look, if God did it, come on, I'm just, I'm not saying anybody here is, I, I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> but God put them out. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, look at this. Or I'm sorry, verses 1 and 2, not 12. Verses 1 and 2. Right? We're in agreement. We want to be used by God, right? We meant what we said. Here am I, send me. Now we got to know how to really, <laughs> so we can cooperate. It requires cooperation. Now, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. And that is possible, or he wouldn't have wrote that. For unto, let's read this. Watch this. Watch, listen to this, these words as you read it. For unto us was the gospel preached. 
as well as unto them. He's referring back in Old Testament and all of that, but ready? Here it is. See, the gospel being preached doesn't affect everybody the same. Why? Because some plates are dirty. <laughs> are you getting the picture? <laughs> okay. All right. But the word preached did not profit them. Why? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Well, that's a powerful verse right there. He said they heard the gospel. These people here is hearing the gospel. He said they're not profiting them. Why? Well, I thought preaching was good enough. No, preaching is only part of the equation. It has to be received. And faith is confidence solely in God. And what corrupts faith is wrong ideas, misconceptions about the will of God. And when that happens, the word becomes standoffed or standoffish or rejected because my ideas are greater than God's now in my own mind. Okay? Now, <laughs> uh, all right, let me, let me, let's turn to Isaiah and I'll just, I got to get into this. I'm trying to hold myself and it's, I'm, I'm about ready to bust my gut. Isaiah. Isaiah, go back to where we were, Isaiah 6. Now you, well, let's look at this now. Because what does that mean? He dropped this in my heart today as well. So just pray it. He just, man, I, I saw it. In verse 8, now again, not going back to all these verses, first seven verses, you have in this epiphany, if you would, I don't know what you want to call it, but I mean, it's, it's real, it's happening here. And he sees God filling his temple. The train's filling the temple. It's, it's incredible. Seraphims are there. Priests can't enter. I mean, it, it's just an amazing, uh, amazing, uh, uh, interesting happening here in manifestation of God's power and glory and, and be praying. I think there's going to be protocol for God's glory to show up. I think that's a message right now that's really taken root here in my heart, maybe for Sunday. I'm all excited about that because God's glory never just shows up. There are protocols and uh, I'll tell you what, you'd be amazed at the protocol. And, and we can have the glory of God and not visiting. See, I'm going to stop. I said this on Sunday, kind of wet or whistle. You know, God will visit a house you build. But he will only live in the house he builds. See, see God will even visit. He'll visit a sinner. But he won't live there. <laughs> He'll visit him with conviction. He'll visit him with the word of God to try to move and woo his spirit, but he won't live there. But when we build a house constructed by his pattern, glory will come. Amen. Okay? That's just, that's a little bit, there you go. Or it won't even cost you a penny. I didn't even charge for that. All right? Verse 8. All right? Ephesians, or Ephesians. Uh, Isaiah 4, uh, 6, 8. Ready? Let's all read this. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, ready? Here am I. Send me. Whew. Now, I'm going to read some more verses in a moment. But what does that mean to you and what does it mean to me? One of the mistakes the Lord dropped in my heart, and I just, it just, I was even motioning in prayer. I, I mean, this is how it was. And what does that mean? I'll just use myself and say, all right, what does that mean? When I said Sunday night, Lord, here am I, send me. But right away, get the cart before the horse, you know. Right away was I starting to think, all right, here am I, send me. Oh, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be glamorous. Now, I want you to know something. The callings of God is not always glamorous. <laughs> and I said, I said to God, I wasn't doing this, but I'm just saying, how many times have we and how many times have I? But I look at God and say, here am I, send me. Uh, and then right away, secretly in my mind, I'm thinking, I know what's going to happen. God is going to send me to the Eskimos in northern Canada, and I'm going to start an outreach, and oh, it's going to be something. Now, wait a minute. See, I got my eyes way out here. And sometimes we can get our eyes on things way out here and we can miss the person standing right next to us. <laughs> Are you getting this? 
I just want to slow down and enjoy this. I'm looking out here, oh, Eskimo, oh, glamorous, oh, I mean, this. oh, yes, here am I, send me. Uh, no, here am I, send me. I'm not telling God where to send me. I'm waiting to hear from God. Now, God, where do you want to send me? Here am I, send me. And I'm looking out here. Next thing you know, oh, I'm looking at that. I'm looking at that. And I'm passing people that are standing right next to me where God is really saying, no, not there. I'm calling you to somebody standing right next to you who needs to hear the gospel preached to them. I'm telling you, I feel like, I feel like my gut's going to fall out. <laughs> How many times, and isn't that really pride? Because I don't want to stoop down to something little. I want to be something great. Huh? Come on. What if God just says, look, I've got a mission for you to go downtown and all I want you to do is, here's my first plan for you. Here, my Lord, send me. Uh, they need help at the soup kitchen. <laughs> Lord, I said, here, my, send me. I'm God's gift to you. Lord, I'm t I mean, I'm something special. I can't be. Hey, listen, I've had people tell me in church over 17 and a half years, I mean, it's exactly, I think, 17 and a half years been bad. And I've, I've had people tell me, come to me, and say, Pastor, uh, we just feel like God's called us to do something in this church. And on the tip of my tongue is, great, we got bathrooms to be cleaned. <laughs> and you know what, you know what the next thing come out of their mouth was? They already set it. They already set up. They had their eyes out here. They forgot about this stuff. And they said to me, I've had people say this, uh, but now, now we don't, we don't, you know, we don't clean uh, the church. We don't do that now. Uh, we won't do this and that. Now, we, we just looking to be up here. You say, what you do, Pastor? I knew right away there's a huge sign. You don't put them anywhere. Arrogance will topple the, the house down. See, if somebody, I don't care if I've been saved 30 years, if I can't clean a bathroom, I'm not qualified to do anything else. <laughs> Here am I, send me. You may feel compelled to come sweep the parking lot. Boy, but <laughs> see, <laughs> come on now. I mean, see, boy, this is a rubber hitting the road. I ain't coming back. I ain't coming back Sunday. We'll be here next Wednesday. We'll wait on you to get back. <laughs> We will. God will wait on you. He's patient. He's long suffering. Ah, oh, you see what I, but I, I, you know what I'm saying is the truth. I'm going to tell the truth here. It, it's, it's, listen, if I'm not willing to do the humblest thing, then God will never raise me up to do anything else. Because if I'm not, look, if I'm not faithful in a little thing, Jesus said it. He said, if you ain't faithful in this, well, you ain't going to be faithful over here. Faithfulness doesn't grow with responsibility. It, faithfulness begins, it's in the heart to begin with. I should be faithful here. Now I can be trusted over here. Before I get to the Eskimos, I don't know why I even thought, he'd just come to, uh, before I get to the Eskimos out of here, God will test, will you humble yourself to take care of what's already around you? Whew. Uh, whew. Glory to God forevermore. Well, what do you mean? Uh, look at verse 9. See, I, I didn't read the rest of the verse Sunday night, but I probably should have. That's my fault because Look at this. He said, and now listen to what God said. And he said to God, go and tell this people. Now look what they say. Look, look, or look what God's saying. He says, hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Now, I don't know about your Bible. I'm using a little different one tonight, a little, little reference Bible. And, and I got intrigued by this when I was reading this. Hear ye indeed. They got, a little, they got a little T there or something. It indicates there's something going on. And so I look below verse 9, and it says, you can translate that or without ceasing. Now what he's saying is Israel heard the word without ceasing. But he said they wouldn't understand. He said they wouldn't perceive it. And you know, that means, that's dangerous, isn't it? When you can hear the word without ceasing and still not understand and still not obey it. 
Verse 10, make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. That's a whole other message right there. But look at verse 11. <laughs> this is the typical human response. When he found out his calling now, Isaiah said, here am I, send me. <laughs> and now Isaiah in two verses, really two, two little, one ain't even just one paragraph really. And now after that, uh, Isaiah realized, well, this ain't too glamorous. I'm going to preach to a people who will never respond. I thought I was going somewhere else and be a big revival. I thought to be, and, 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 and God said, oh, no, you're going to be right here, and you're going, to prof, you're going to prophesy, and you're going to speak to hard-headed people, and to be honest, like Ezekiel. I mean, he even told Ezekiel, he said, you're going to preach all the days of your life, and they ain't, they ain't doing anything. The, only, the purpose for your calling is to Ezekiel. This is what he told me. The purpose, of, I'm putting in my word, but the purpose of your calling is this, that when, basically, they will die in their rebellion. They're so hard-hearted. But he said, one thing for sure, they will know that there was a prophet and a preacher among them. They will be without excuse on judgment day. And that's all Ezekiel's ministry was. It wasn't glamorous at all. Matter of fact, he was persecuted uh, terribly. Well, Isaiah was too. Isaiah literally was put and excommunicated out of the ministry, so to speak, uh, in that day to the point when, when you know how he died? He, was, he died a martyr's death. He was put in a hollowed out tree and they sawed him in two. That's how Isaiah died. Think about that. This was his calling. He said, here am I, send me. He winds up dead in a hollow tree, cut in two. Here am I, send me. Look at the human response, verse 11, after he realizes, boy, this ain't too glamorous. Now look at this. Then said I, re read this first part with him, ready? Then said I, Lord, ready? How long? <laughs> How long do I got to do that? How long am I going to have to be faithful? How long am I going to have to preach to hard-headed people? How long, Lord? I thought when I said, here am I, send me. You had some grandiose scheme and plan for my life. And here you got me down here preaching to hard-headed people. How long, Lord, am I going to do that? And look what God tells him. You can read the rest of it. He said, until everything falls to the ground. Do you know what that meant? You will spend the rest of your days doing this, Isaiah. You said, here am I, send me. So when we say, here am I, send me, it isn't always to preach to 3,000 or 35,000 or 100,000 people. Sometimes it is a lifelong commitment to winning certain people around your life. And the preacher don't do it for you. I'll say it again. And the preacher doesn't do it for you. I'm gonna, now we're going to get into something else. I'm going to show you up here in the wall. It is better to train 10 people to do work than to try to be one person and do the work of 10 people. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. This is where God is leading us. You know what God is asking of us here, my send me? God is asking us to become responsible for our own little world. And that world means where you live and around our lives and our environments. And we all must become educated spiritually enough that we can go win souls on our own. But prove this. This is Bible. Bible, Bible, Bible. Chapter 4 and verse 10. Chapter 4, verse 10, Ephesians. He that descended, this is Jesus. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above. Okay, I got to premise this one more thing. And here's the reason why. When I was talking about that plate and cluttered, I tell you one thing, church has got to change in many areas. You will see where church in different countries imitate their style of government. In America, church is run like a democracy. According to the Bible, church was not a democracy. We are the product of a kingdom. Different way of running. I can take you to other nations in the world and nations I've been in. Their churches look like a dictatorship because that's their government. 
You can go to other places of the world and you see it's almost like the church is imitating the governments of this world and we're not of this world. So when we approach the Bible, we got to throw off the democracy mindset, okay? Because this is a kingdom. <laughs> and one thing a kingdom does is it lays responsibility on each of its citizens, okay? Now, he that descended the same all and ascended up far above all heavens, they might fill all things. And he gave some, these are the fivefold ministry gifts, apostles, some prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Now read with me, what is, what is this for? There is purpose for this. Ready? For the perfecting of the saints. What is perfecting? Is bringing, it's equipping, bringing maturity, development, and so forth, educationally, spiritually, and, and equipping them, the saints. Now read on. For what per Why is the saints being equipped? For what? For the work of the ministry. That means every person in this church has a job to do in ministry. Two amens on that. See, this is where the American church is. We pay one guy, one woman to do it all. That is not Bible. Okay? Also, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The word edify there means to build up. It is every believer's job to help build the body and family of God. How do you do that? One way is, yeah, development and education, all that, spiritually speaking. But it also, a huge component of this verse is, you're bringing people in who are unsaved, who are getting saved, or those you are discipling yourself. And you bring them in, and that builds the body of Christ. See? Boy, it's getting quieter now. The tire's really getting flatter on the road. Now notice too, we all come to the unity of the faith, this is verse 13, of the knowledge of the Son of God and a perfect man on the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth now and be no more children. God is always out when somebody is saved. He gives them a span of time of adolescence, just like a human body, but after a while he expects growth to the point they are able to instruct other people, not just pastors. Everybody has to come to the place they can instruct somebody else. Amen? Okay? No more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. One thing that should never be said, if you have been saved even for five years, if you've been saved for five years, these words should never come out of your mouth. Well, I was over there talking to somebody there and witnessing and I didn't know what to say. That is a shame. Because if you sit in this church, you have been pummeled with the word of God, instruction, and given understanding on what to do. Huh? I've had people already over the years been saved for oh, I don't know how many years and, and didn't know they would have me come to witness to somebody in their family. They should have been witnessing to their family. They couldn't do it. They didn't know what. My question is, what have you been doing in church all of that time? <laughs> You're wasting time. This, is, this, is, this takes effort to be in the house of God in this sense. We're worshiping, we're magnifying God. At the same time, we have to make an effort to hear what's the Lord saying to me and not falling asleep. Yeah. Honey, you can fall asleep during O'Reilly or somebody else, but you don't fall asleep with the Word of God. Yeah. Why? This might be the difference between life and death. This might also mean the difference between somebody getting saved by your influence on their life. It's no time to fall asleep here. And, and, and it's no time to clack the watch and wonder why we're in church so long. Huh? Come on. You know, people go to movies on Friday night, two-hour movies or three-hour movies, and, uh, man, they're popping popcorn. And when the show's over, woo, wow, well, it's 11 o'clock, man. I tell, where'd the time go? I tell you, in church, it ought to be the same way. Man, I don't know where the time goes. It's such a good time in the house of God. I know in some churches it's dead as Job's turkey. I understand that. <laughs> That's not, I understand. <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I do. 
it's bad even when the church mice fall asleep and snore, you know. And they, but, but I understand that. But I'm telling you, in a, in a normal environment here, tossed to and fro, he said, with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lay, lay in wait to see, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up, I love that word, grow up in him and all things, which is the head, even Christ. And so when we see this, I'm just slowing down and teaching here tonight here in the, in going in the last part of this, but every, Vance Habner said this, and I, I like this. He said, you know, every Christian is commissioned, not just one, two people. Everybody's commissioned. For every Christian is a missionary. Every one of us in here is a missionary. You have a family to win. You have friends to win. You have coworkers to win. And that's not to somebody else's responsibility. That's yours and that's mine. If that's my environment, that's mine. Okay? That, that is our job. It has been said, I'm going to tell you what Vance said. I really like this. He said, it has been said that the gospel is not merely something to come to church to hear, but something to go from the church to tell. And we are all appointed to tell it. Can you say Amen. And it also has been said, I, I got this here in quotes, Christianity be began as a company of lay witnesses. Here's the problem. He said, but it has become a professional pulpitism financed by lay spectators. And, and nowadays, we, this is him talking. He says, nowadays we hire a church staff to do full-time Christian work and we sit in church on Sunday to watch them do it. You know, I even get a little tight today when I see this, and, and don't fall out with me, but I'm serious, that... I get a little tight about the American church as a whole where the worship people here, I'd like to tell most of them, you probably ought to just go sit down. For one thing, they're too distracting. Some of them ought to cover themselves more. And another thing is, when you have the light show and everything else, and well, they do that's their business, but the light show and everything else dim the church. But my, my thing is, that then it creates a spectator theater type look and a feel when really, and I, I read an article out of Christmas here recently, and it said, what is it, four or five ways to kill church? And one of, they really hammered on this worship experience. People are sitting in or standing in the pews during worship hour. They worship an hour. They only preach about 10, 15 minutes. But they worship for an hour. And the people are complaining, we don't know the songs, we can't sing them, we don't know what this and that, and that tells me, what are we doing? <laughs> Everybody should be worshiping. Everybody. We believe that here, and that's our uh, context. I mean, uh, we, we never want to take away from the worship. We want you to be able to worship God. You sing. You worship. You get to know the song. You can speak it out. You praise him. And, and you say, well, uh, we need a 30-member choir. No, really, we're all the choir. We just all get out here and sing. Amen. We all get out here and worship. Amen. And that's the way it ought to be. This is a group thing. And come together. And we're not hiring somebody to do it for us. We can worship ourselves. Hmm. <laughs> you see... <laughs> Every Christian is meant to be in full-time Christian service. There's indeed a special ministry of pastors, teachers, evangelists, but for what? For the perfecting of the saints for their ministry. That's what Vance had. I, I really like that. You see, uh, we, we cannot create an environment to perpetually depend on another person other than Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to show this. Going back to the biblical model, and I'll show you. I got this. I think it was out. Goodness gracious. Now we on copyright, won't they? Um, Complete biblical uh, Christian, what is it? The CBL, I can't get it out. Uh, I have it on my program I purchased uh, on my uh, word search program that I use in preparing and message and so forth. It's a commentary, just like uh, Adam Clark or anybody else. They had this model I'm going to show you. But going back to the biblical model, I really like this. But first of all, you see these three things. We read out of Ephesians. The gifts do what? They equip the gifts. The ministerial gifts is what? Everything is here to serve one another. Even what I'm doing now, I am serving you. Just like a waiter or a waitress serves you food. I am, at, I am at God's command to serve you the word or the food of God. Okay? Okay? So you understand. The gifts do what? They equip the saints. I am tonight, what am I supposed to do for Mount Calvary? And even some watching, that I am to be equipping you with something to go and do. Number two, for what reason? The saints then do what? I've served you tonight. What should you do? Now you go and serve somebody else. Amen. Then what happens? This is how this ought to work. This is a biblical model. Then the body is then built up. 
What's that mean? Oh, our selves are being built up uh, spiritually and strengthened, but at the same time, even numerically, other people are coming in because of our labors in their lives. <laughs> Glory to God. Are you ready for this? I don't know if you can see this very good, but I'll, I'll point it out and you'll see it. They use this as a model. Again, this complete biblical whatever I can't think of, it's CBL. Um, they used this in Ephesians, and I really liked it. I said, you know what? That is exactly right. That is the Ephesian model. And you say, what is it? These here, and they were kind of explaining some of this, and, and so I just went off on what they were saying as well. And I thought, this is true. It's biblical. They said, you know, you can make believe, you know, that here in the center is these fivefold ministry gifts or whatever. And you can even put a, a pastor, whatever the case, okay? In this case that we're dealing here, all right? It's right here. But then... You have a congregation, okay? You have this congregation. This word is going out, north, south, and east and west, and you have this going out. These are people sitting there or what have you, okay? We can even add them on. But here, they're being served the word of God. Then what they do is they go out, they get another one, they get another one, they get another one. Same here. See this? They, they are witnessing they are then discipling. They are involved in their lives. This is the biblical example. It's right here. Notice, though, notice these, this one here, these four, don't just sit there, and then this guy bypasses them and goes out here and does all that. No, no. He does what? She does what? She's equipping, he's equipping the saints. And then what does the saints do? They go out and they get folks. And then eventually, guess what happens? When these are saved, when these get saved, then what do they do? It just keeps going and going and going. All right? Now, serving here, serve there. They serve this one. They serve this one. Then eventually, this one here serves this one, serves this one. And it just keeps going, growing, going, growing. So it's just going and growing. And it just keeps going and going. Notice this guy here does not do the work of all of these people. What do you do? You train these people to do the work. That's the biblical model. Amen. Can you say amen tonight? Amen. So when we said, here am I, send me, we weren't talking about going to the Eskimos or going to Africa or going to Russia or going to China. Now, God can do that. God can call. And that, that could be somebody and someone taken away. But generally speaking, when we say, Lord, I'm available, this is what he's talking about. Right? This is where we live. How many knows we can leave here and go somewhere else and win people, and yet there's people here that need saved? <laughs> and we need to go to the Eskimos, and, and the Eskimos need saved, right? But how many knows that even though the Eskimos need saved, but yet you walk out these church doors, and there's an entire community that needs saved? That means you don't even have to go get cold. Some of you ought to get that at least in an hour. Amen. I'm picking on you. I'm picking. All right. I guess I might as well. I, my, I'm not done. My word, the time's flying. Where are we at on the time here? Can you help me? Am, am I way? Ten minutes. Whew. See, hey, let's all say, my, where did the time go? I thought there a minute Ryan was yawning, but he was putting a piece of candy. I thought he was getting, going, no, he was putting a candy in his mouth. All right. I, I was going to take you to 2 Samuel, and that's somewhere we need to go eventually. But let me just say this. I like this. Nathan Schaefer said this. At the close of life, because look, we only live once in this body. We're going to live forever in a glorified body. But you only got one fly through in this part of our lives, okay? At the close of life, the question will not be, how much have you gotten? but how much have you given? Not how much have you won, but how much have you done? Not how much have you saved, but how much have you sacrificed? It will be how much have you loved and served, not how much you were honored. Nathan Schaefer said that. I thought that was good. At the end of life, it's not about how much I've accumulated, it's how much I've given and sacrificed. 
when we get to the end of the road, we need to be like Paul. We need to be fully expended, totally spent. I've given everything I've got. That's why I said I'm not being mean on Sunday, and please, and I'm not going to go to 2 Samuel. I'm just going to close here. But, but <laughs> this is why I said on Sunday, and I'm not being mean. It was not in any way, shape, or form. But, but even when we retire, physically, I'm not talking about people sick and shut-ins. I'm talking about even when we retire, we don't retire from God. We still have a job to do. We still have work in the kingdom to do. And sometimes, and I've seen this over the years, and I'm not throwing stones at me. I mean, taking vacations, doing all that. Please don't take it overboard. I'm not meaning it that way. But I think at times we get to the point at the end of our lives and we think, it's just going to be me now. It's just everything about me. We're that much closer to home. Why not make every minute count? <laughs> Come on. I, I'm serious. I'm telling you, even in a nursing home that with a person who has their mind still, Alzheimer's, I understand that. Even with their mind, I tell you what, you can fight to the end. You can wheel out to your neighbor and say, I've got to tell you about the greatest story that was ever told. People can still do that. It, wouldn't it be great that the last breath we take here is telling about the goodness of Jesus Christ? I had a great grandmother that was doing that, Granny. She was doing that in the nursing home. She was, a, she was how old was she? Eight, what was she, almost 90? And almost 90. And when she, when she passed away, and up until those times, I have her Bible in the pulpit here. In 1977, she was God that she died, what, five years later. And in five years, and you can't even count the last year altogether, and in those couple of years, that Bible, I can show it to you, is marked from beginning to end. I mean, tore up, marked. I can't even use it. It's just scribbled in notes. And, 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 but I cherish it because it tells me that if the Lord tarries and I live to that age and I still have my capacity, I want to still be marking my Bible up as I do today. I still want to be just as on fire, even more on fire. And I know the body don't allow you, but your spirit man isn't old. Huh? In Paul said, hey, my, my body's outward body's dying. Day. Ooh, he said, but that inward, that inward man is renewed day by day. <laughs> you can be 100 years old and the body's not going to move as quick. But boy, that spirit can be lightning fast. Whew. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? Amen. Huh? Ain't you, aren't you glad you told Aunt Bessie you can come and, and drink milk and eat cereal, but I'm going to church. I mean, it's worth it. Amen. Praise God. Well, I was going to take you to 2 Samuel, but we'll get there maybe another time because i got to show you that little piece as well that goes along with David, and uh, we'll deal with that. Let's just stand this evening. I'll, we'll just pray.